Okay, great. Uh, the clock just struck 3 o'clock here in a very snowy and unpleasant uh, New York City. Um, so we're just about ready to get started. Thank you everyone so much for joining us today um, for our webinar with Library Link NJ, Making the Most of It, Best Practices and Activities for One-Shot Instruction. Um, I know that there were a lot of school closings going on in New Jersey today, so we really appreciate you taking the time to meet with us. It's definitely a hectic day for many of us, um, so we're really looking forward to taking a break uh, from the craziness of the weather and hoping that we'll be able to um, bring some valuable information to you today. So just to give you a little bit of background information um, on our company, this is uh, Imagine Easy Solutions, although there are more of us now um, since this photo was taken. But we are an educational technology company that was founded back in 2001. Um, we're based out of New York City, and we're most well known for our citation tool EasyBib, but we also develop other um, education-related products, including our information literacy instruction platform, Research Ready. And just to give you a little bit of background information on myself, um, my name is Emily Gover. I am one of the information literacy librarians here at Imagine Easy Solutions. Um, I also work part-time as a public reference librarian up in Westchester County as well. Um, and I've previously worked um, in academic and special libraries, including Berry College, um, which is down in Georgia, a very small uh, private institution as well as Reader's Digest and the University at Albany. So just to give you a little bit of background information um, on my experiences before joining uh, the EdTech side of the library space. So we're here today um, just to talk about one-shot instruction. As I mentioned before, I worked as an academic librarian at my last job, and much of my instructional experience there was through one-shot instruction with freshman students. And from what I gather, it, it seems that in general, it really is the most common form of instruction for a lot of us. Um, one thing that we do at EasyBib is to use our access to librarians and students just to learn more about what's really happening in library land and what their research, and in this case, instructional habits are. So a couple of years ago, we surveyed a few hundred librarians in the K-12 and academic space on what is their most common form of information literacy instruction. So you can see here on this pie chart um, that more than half, over 57%, um, taught only one-shot instruction sessions, while an additional 19% had a combination of both a full course um, as well as one-shot one sessions as well. Um, so this just means from this statistic that one-shot sessions account, at least in part, um, for, as the primary form of instruction for over 75% of the librarians that we polled. So uh, kind of aligns with the general belief here that one-shot instruction is oftentimes the only form of interaction that you'll have uh, with a group of students. So this means that a lot of you have probably felt like this at some point during your career um, where you're just so overwhelmed or frustrated or at a loss that you really can't help but just want to kind of smack your head against the desk. One shots are really tricky business um, and it's incredibly overwhelming just to find a balance between time constraints and effective instruction while figuring out how to cover the major topics that the instructor wants and also meeting the learning levels of the students. Collaborating with colleagues um, can also be an added challenge for some of you um, as well, in addition to all of these other concerns that you may have. So we'll begin this presentation uh, by talking about some of the best practices that you can apply to make your one-shot session successful. These are different ideas and pieces of advice that have been offered by librarians working in both the K-12 and the academic space. Um, so these can be applied to both levels of learning. We didn't want to get too specific because we knew we would have a diverse audience today, so we wanted to make sure we were kind of covering all ground here. So first and foremost, um, forming strong relationships is really imperative for effective instruction. So yes, having a close relationship uh, with students is vitally important, 
But for one-shot sessions, having a strong relationship with your colleagues is vital. And we'll ex expand upon that a little bit right now. So it can seem like there's a lot to juggle um, when you're first planning your one-shot sessions. When I first started working at Barry College, I was fresh out of library school and I had great mentors, but when you started to do it on your own, um, it was definitely overwhelming because there's so much that you need to take into consideration. Um, but by having a working relationship with the instructor who asks you to participate in this one-shot session, um, you'll be able to more effectively manage their and your expectations, which ultimately makes the planning and teaching process a lot easier. On paper, um, in an email or whatever, the instructor may ask you to cover a whole wealth of information literacy skills that is really just impossible. Um, so you need to clarify with them what it is that they really need to get done. Is there a specific database that they would like you to review with the students? Um, you really also need to understand what their assignment is about. And so by understanding their expectations and being on the same page, you'll also be able to develop an effective plan of attack when you're actually meeting with the students. Additionally, by understanding the learning levels and needs of your students, which again you can do by just talking with the instructor, you'll also be able to introduce them to information literacy concepts that they'll be able to grasp and understand and just use on their own accord without overwhelming them. Third, you must be realistic. Um, I know that this is a really general statement, if you will, um, but we've dedicated an entire slide to this, so just to expand upon that a little bit more. Setting realistic goals, I mean, it's not necessarily a simple task. It's kind of easier said than done. Um, after all, you may already be feeling pressure from the different stressors and concerns that we talked about a few slides back, um, like time constraints and making sure that you're covering all of the necessary skills and topics in the class. So I think most importantly, um, with one shot, you're not going to be able to cover everything that you want to and that you hope to. You just aren't. And it's really difficult for librarians to accept that, um, at least for me, but it's something that you just kind of need to realize. So one way to work around that is, of course, by clarifying what the instructor needs, um, as we discussed on the previous slide, and then defining one or two learning outcomes for the class. Um, Potentially three, it really depends on what, how long the class is. Uh, for K through 12, you may only have you know, 30 to 45 minutes. Um, academic librarians may have upwards of an hour and 20 minutes. So make sure that you're keeping um, within, making sure that your goals are within a reasonable time constraint. Um, one of the best articles that I read on one-shot instruction while I was putting this presentation together is called Notes from the Field, 10 Short Lessons on One-Shot Instruction um, by Megan Oakleaf and several other librarians. And I really encourage all of you to take a look. Um, we've included this in our bibliography at the end, and we also have a public link to the bibliography as well, which we'll share with you during the presentation and also afterwards as well. Anyway, the point of this is, is in one of in this article, one of the librarians who contributed to it, uh, Stephen Hoover, says that you and the instructor need to determine what needs to be learned versus what would be nice to learn. Um, understanding the minute limiters of a really subject-specific database would be really nice. I mean, it would be great if we could make uh, you know, librarians out of all of these students, but you also have to think about if there are other areas in which the student is already lacking that they need to understand first. Um, additionally, skills that require active learning and are ones that they're going to use beyond the scope of this specific assignment for this specific class while they're in college, those are the skills that will probably leave the biggest impact in such a short amount of time as they're practical and useful and students will be able to apply them in different situations throughout college and even beyond into their professional career as well. So I mentioned before that that article uh, was primarily written by this woman named Megan Oakley. Um, she's a professor at Syracuse University's iSchool, and she's a real mover and shaker in the one-shot instruction space. Um, she's built out this egg diagram that you can actually apply to one-shot instruction to kind of help you figure out um, and pinpoint the most important research skills 
that should be the focus around your unique one-shot instruction time. So the way that I view this is that at the heart of the egg, which you can see right here, um, I colored it yellow like a yolk to make it more visual, um, you have the enduring understanding um, aspect of it. So these are the most hands-on and active learning techniques that are both relevant to the assignment and also research projects um, in the future. So this could be something like evaluating sources for credibility or demonstrating uh, different types of search strategies like broadening or narrowing your search. Moving out to the next layer, um, the egg white covers things that are important to know and do and are considered lifelong learning skills but can technically be learned in other capacities. So for example, you know, we can all agree that giving credit to information that's not yours is a necessary lifelong skill because plagiarism um, affects everyone outside of school, whether students believe that or not. Um, but learning the ins and outs of citations, those types of things can be learned through libguides or handouts or on the instructor's own time or even through tools like EasyBib. So yes, they relate to librarianship for sure, but these are things that teachers or professors will be familiar with too, and they can use other aspects of class time to focus on that. So the last layer, or the shell, I'm guessing, um, are things that are worth being familiar with, but definitely not crucial in terms of in-person instruction with a librarian. So this could be things like training students on different productivity tools like RefWorks, or letting them know about your reference interviews, or if you have uh, Mevo or other sorts of instant messaging reference, virtual reference tools, or even giving them you know, a library orientation and just giving them a tour of the library. So I understand that some of you may be thinking, like, how can you expect us to not talk about LibGuides or tell them where the reference desk is? And we're not trying to say that these things are unimportant, it's just that they can't be a priority in a one-shot session. There's no doubt that you know, it's challenging to figure out how to prioritize these skills, but forming a strong and ideally collaborative relationship with the instructor and ensuring that you guys are on the same page will make it much more manageable. So just to summarize the best uh, practices for prioritizing, First, you know, work with the instructor as much as possible and then prioritize the learning outcomes by defining which aspects are hands-on and require active learning. And remember, these are things that are going to be re relevant to the specific class assignment and ideally life as well or at least in other areas of their college or um, high school career. You also want to focus on skills that are um, important to know or do but then can technically be learned without uh, in-person library instruction. So that should be lower down on the priorities list. Um, third, kind of at the bottom of the totem pole, if you will, are things that students should be familiar with, but they're not pertinent necessarily to the assignment at hand. Once you've identified and prioritized um, one or two learning outcomes, maybe three, depending on your time constraints, uh, the other aspect of a successful one-shot is, of course, to assess the students. So it's really hard to tell if your one-shot instruction is effective if you don't have any data or examples to support it. Um, so one way to assess students is through action-based learning, where students actually demonstrate the skills that you defined as a learning outcome at the beginning when you were planning the lesson. So some of the examples that I read when I was doing research for this was you could have students conduct search queries with broader or narrower keywords and have them explain how those scenarios worked out for them. Um, in a much more hands-on approach, you could also have them physically sort primary and secondary sources to better understand the characteristics of each. That might be something fun for a K-12 librarian to do um, with the kids to make them better understand the traits that make up primary and secondary sources. So of course, um, you can always take a more standard approach that will allow you to collect hard data on how students are grasping these skills. Um, so we've listed some of the tools that are available um, online, and some of them are free, and that includes uh, products like Trails, Sales, 
Uh, Megan Oakley's also put together a grading rubric called Rails. Um, so I think you guys are probably catching on to a trend here. Um, there are also some paid tools as well that can help you with your information literacy assessment, <clears throat> such as um, Research Ready, which is another product that we offer here at Imagine Easy Solutions, um, and also the ETS iSkills. Um, so some of these platforms like Research Ready will allow you to customize the questions to your own liking, which is great for one shots um, because you won't be able to cover all of the skills that are set, assessed in the more thorough platforms like Sales and Trails. So they're much more comprehensive, um, and I really encourage you to check them out and just see what it is that they have to offer and how they best fit into your instruction. I also need to mention Google Forms as well. Um, I know that in all cases, seemingly all cases, libraries are strapped for cash, so if you can't afford um, a paid service, you can always just use Google Forms to build out your questions and then save the responses that students have to a Google spreadsheet for further analysis as well. So talking about how you can prioritize one-shot sessions is one thing, um, but we also wanted to explain how other librarians have created quick exercises to make the most of their limited time with one-shot sessions. Um, one librarian, Joe Hardenbrook, um, he has a really great blog, he discussed a five-minute exercise that he does at the beginning um, of class to get students just to start kind of thinking about the concepts of information and access and just to sort of get them, in, um, get them into that mindset, if you will. So um, he is a K-12 librarian, but this can easily be applied to smaller classes in academia as well. So it's a very simple process of just having students answer three different questions. So the first question that he puts up on the board is, where does information come from? Um, and then he facilitate, facilitates responses from students. And it could be something like Google or Facebook. Um, and then, of course, they'll likely mention other things like newspapers and, of course, books. So that's the first question that he asks. He has the kids go up. They write their responses on the board. Then he asks, what do you want your information to be like? So with this, he usually gets responses like, I want my information to be truthful. I want it to be accurate. And um, in a lot of cases, they also say that they want their information to be easy to find. So in this situation, um, he sort of reiterates the importance of authority and credibility in the information. And he also points out that just because information is easy to find, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's appropriate to use. So if you choose to do this exercise, you can gauge the responses from your students and highlight you know, maybe two or three that you want to emphasize. Finally, uh, Hardenbrook asks the third question, which is, what do you want uh, that information to do for you? So in this case, students will think about you know, the quality of information that they want to find. So his students had responses like, I want the information to give me examples. I want it to be able to support my opinion, or I want it to be able to give me different ideas. Um, so he gives context to this last question by explaining that you know, students are finding and evaluating information every day. Um, it could even be something like just going on to TMZ and just figuring out if the latest story about Justin Bieber is true or not, and they really just need to use those skills and just apply it to doing research for school instead. So this seems like a very simple and acceptable exercise. Um, it doesn't really involve any technology, it's just having a conversation with the kids um, and helping them get a better understanding of thinking about information and access. On a more technology-related note, um, if there are any K-12 librarians here who use a flipped classroom or academic librarians who are able to work with professors to have their students do a little bit of learning beforehand um, as homework, you can also try some of these flipped classroom suggestions for one-shot sessions as well. So the key thing to remember um, is that with flipped classroom learning, it's not just about having students blindly click through slides on Blackboard or having them watch a screencast that you made about a database on YouTube. You need to include some sort of interactive element to it. So that could be having students contribute to an online discussion forum. forum. You know, if you are using Blackboard, 
um, or having students complete a quiz or a survey. You need to be able to incorporate some sort of elements so that they can take the static information, which would be the content or the videos that you want them to go through, and then have them critically think about it. So for the at-home work, um, some of the librarians um, that were writing about this, they suggested that you should focus on more of the procedural tasks, like an overview of the library catalog, um, and save the hands-on process-based learning tasks for in the classroom. This also kind of aligns with what we were talking about before um, with Megan Oakley's um, egg for helping you understand one-shot sessions. So once you're in the classroom for a one-shot um, using the flipped classroom model, your focus should be more on, again, action and process-based learning. So this could be things like selecting or evaluating sources that they're going to use in their assignments. So this is your time to shine as an information expert, whether you're doing flipped classroom instruction or not. So however you decide to do it, just don't spend it going over things that students can learn at home. And make yourself available and serve as the so-called guide on the side, which is the phrase that is stressed um, during flipped classroom instruction. So one struggle that I was faced with while I was working at Barry, um, and I know that many other librarians have faced this as well, is that you know, you get an instructor, you do outreach, and you get an instructor who's interested in doing a one-shot session, um, and you've been doing outreach and advocating for it, and you finally do that session, and then once it's over, that relationship kind of fizzles out. So we all have a lot going on. Librarians have a lot going on. Teachers have a lot going on. Professors have a lot going on. And it can be really easy to kind of lose touch with the people that you're working with and before you know it, you know, the new semester is starting and you don't have any instruction sessions set up. So how are you able to keep the momentum going? One librarian at the University of Houston uh, wrote a really great article discussing one-shot instruction. And she made a good point that sometimes it's just a matter of keeping professors, or in the K-12 space, teachers, um, in the loop. So this is a manageable task that you can do you know, once or twice a semester. It doesn't involve as much effort as going out literally like in person and introducing yourself. And if you have time to do that, that's great. But this is one way, if you are swamped um, and crunched for time, this is one way that you're able um, to kind of keep the momentum going uh, in partnering for one-shot sessions. So, if you're an academic librarian who you know, maybe serves as a liaison to different departments or you're a subject specialist, send out an email you know, once every couple of months with any updates or new resources that may be relevant to professors. So if you have a new database to share or a new journal subscription, or even you know, maybe you've just had time to spruce up and update some of the libguides. So giving professors a, re like a refresher, if you will, on what you have available is a really simple way to keep them informed about different things that are going on at the library. One reason why professors may not come to the library on an ongoing basis is because, you know, a lot of them, oops, sorry, a lot of them use the same syllabi for many semesters, and some of them even use the same syllabus for, for years. Um, so the content remains static, and they stick to what they know, and they may not really make an effort to learn about new resources that the library has that can also be applied to their, um, to their course. So letting them know about the new things that you can offer them will allow them to sort of mix up their class a little without having to rework an entire syllabus. The other thing too that I have listed on here are OERs, um, which stands for Open Educational Resources. And these are free tools that are often designed by academics or teachers or nonprofits um, that assist in instruction and learning. So OERs are discussed frequently in the education space. I'm sure you've read about them or you've at least seen this uh, acronym somewhere. And there are so many different resources out there for you to share with your colleagues. So again, even if your budget is tight and you don't have any new things to highlight with them, you can always fall back on sharing some OERs sort of like as a backup plan as well. Regardless of how you approach your one-shot instruction sessions, just know that students do appreciate it. It's a lot of hard work. 
Um, and one study that I read that was talking about effective library instruction found that students value the input and guidance from the librarian as the most helpful way for learning information literacy skills. And I know that's probably kind of an obvious statement, but it's always nice to get that validation every now and again. Um, so whether you, know, you have to go it alone in the classroom or you have multiple meetings with students in a co-taught class throughout the school year, your teaching does make a difference. So I just wanted to make sure that, um, that I put that in there so that you guys know that not all hope is lost. Um, and your instruction is valued by students. If you want to learn more um, about making the most of your library instruction, I would really encourage you to check out um, one of our videos. We have an ongoing free professional development series um, through that we partner with uh, different educators and librarians and technology enthusiasts. Um, and we have these two great academic librarians present on communicating the value of information literacy. So one of the earlier points that I put in the presentation was forming a strong relationship, and this webinar really provides a lot of valuable information for you. Um, so you can find that on our YouTube channel. So the link is down there, youtube.com slash user slash easybitvideos. It's about an hour, but you know, it's on demand, so you can uh, watch it at your own convenience and click through as need be. We also um, have information about this webinar on our blog at content.easybit.com. Um, and if you'd like to see some of the additional resources that they shared, you'll be able to find that on our blog as well. I would be amiss uh, not to include a bibliography of all of the sources that I consulted while putting this uh, presentation together. Um, we also have it linked um, at the URL be below, so tinyurl.com slash easybib one shot. You can also find the information um, and the different articles and reports and blogs that I talked about today all right there. So with that said, um, that concludes the informational portion of the presentation. Um, but please stick around if you're able to. Uh, my colleague Brad is uh, sitting here right next to me. And he's going to be doing um, a demonstration of EasyBib. And he'll also be able to tell you about the different discounts that are offered um, as a, being a member of Library Link NJ. Um, with EasyBib and Research Ready. So uh, hang on tight just for a couple of minutes. I just need to switch over the presenter privileges to him. And um, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to meet with us, and I hope that you found this informative. Okay, great everyone. Um, you should be able to see uh, the EasyBib homepage and um, I will pass it off to Brad. If you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat box. Great. Thank you very much, Emily. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Emily said, my name is Brad Herringer and I'm actually the Imagine Easy representative for New Jersey. Uh, to give you some background about New Jersey and Imagine Easy solutions, I do want to let you know that there are currently over uh, 50 subscribers in New Jersey of our EasyBib School Edition platform along with EasyBib Library Edition. And we also have seven colleges in New Jersey that subscribe. And that doesn't include uh, some other big names outside the state such as NYU, Ohio State, and Tulane. Uh, but I'm going to give a quick uh, high-level overview of EasyBib School Edition, which is our premium resource that touches upon some of the things that Emily mentioned in her presentation. So if your students want to manage their, their research, EasyBib is the place where they can do that. When students create their own account and they log in, they'll see customization here on the right-hand side that you can customize for your school, your 
your college, your university. Put in your logo and then customize links to uh, your home pages, your databases, etc. And the idea here is to create an easy two-way workflow between our resources and your resources so students can take advantage of everything. On the left-hand side, your faculty can create folders that students can drop their work into. We'll start a new project, whether it's History 101, English 101, or specific topics such as Japan. We'll choose a default style and click Create. Here's where your projects will be listed. We have your bibliography, your notebook, and paper. We do not save any papers here on EasyBid. Rather, it will open up into a Google document. Up top here are five most commonly used resources, but we do have almost 60 other options that students can choose from. So they can cite everything from an advertisement, book, federal bill, even something on TV, as well as uploading from third-party databases. We also have some uh, really uh, helpful partnerships uh, with many databases out there that allow you to export uh, directly from an article or journal right into EasyBim. To cite a website, I'm going to use a Wikipedia article as an example. It is our most cited website on EasyBib. I know some schools allow it, many don't, or uh, some librarians say it's a good place to start, not a good place to finish. What we do is we scrape the metadata from the website and we collect whatever information that we're able to. We have the website title, article title, and so on. And we also list what we're unable to find. Then we provide a rating. We'll click Y. Here's where students can really enhance those info lit and critical thinking skills by asking themselves, themselves questions about the author, the publisher, bias, and so on. Really getting them to think critically about the information that they're using. We'll click Continue. We auto-populate the fields. We see here that Wikipedia does not list its contributors and that's why it's outlined in red. As we continue to go through this information, we always recommend that students uh, proof this for any errors that, that might have happened. On the right hand side, this is our Learn Site widget. This shows where each piece of information is located within the citation along with proper uh, punctuation and explanation underneath it. In a way, sort of sub subliminally reinforcing what you're already teaching them. We can evaluate the website again. We can add an, add add an annotation excuse me, and create citation. Here we are. If a professor were to instruct the students to use APA, simply click APA or Chicago and it reformats it for you. We also have footnoting available. If we want to cite a book, we can simply put in a book title, click Cite. Oh, excuse me. Choose that result. And again, we auto populate the fields. You can choose the medium and create citation. If it was required that the student hand in the, their work, you can easily export as a Google document or Microsoft Word document, it will be fully formatted and ready to hand in. Or you can share it over EasyBim. Put in the email address of your instructor or your group member if you're working collaboratively, permissions that are allowed, and then this target folder will populate with the folders that were already created. So uh, that goes back to what I was showing you in the beginning, if a faculty member made a uh, you know, English 101, English 201, English 305, whatever class I was in, I can drop it in there, or periods 1, 2, and 3. So this will allow you to come in here and say, Brad, don't use Wikipedia as a credible source, find something else, or why are you citing 1984? You're supposed to be writing about Japan. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have an ancillary tool to that, which is this analyze feature here. Uh, this is where students take ownership of their work. I like to describe it as a way for them to see citations through the eyes of their instructor. We create a bibliography score based on the diversity of source types, database usage, website credibility, and the number of sources to pages. And we have fancy colorful pie charts on the right hand side. Some things we don't chart, uh, we chart but not a part of the score, years that your sources were published, date cited, and annotations. So that was the bibliography. I know I went over it kind of fast. Uh, if anybody is interested to learn more about this, you can contact me anytime at brad at imagineasy.com. Uh, either Emily or Katie will be putting that in the chat box for you. But we're not done yet. I want to show you the notebook. I'm going to go into 
uh, classic novels project I have open here. Once a student has created a project, uh, done some research, has a citation or two, they can start to take notes. Here, instead of using 3x5 index cards, we virtualized. We, vir we have a virtual desktop here. Go up top and click New Note. Enter in a title to your note card, and then to avoid inadvertent plagiarism, you could actually associate a source that this note card is referencing. Put in your quote, paraphrase, and comment. So we're scaffolding this note-taking process because it is a gray area many times for students between paraphrasing and quotes and their own words and paraphrasing. And then they could organize it, choose a color, and click Save Note. This can be dragged all around the desktop, drop it on top of a group. You can have as many note cards in a group as you would like. Title that note card. On the left-hand side, if you click List View, you can see the note cards in an expanded fashion. And then you can continue down the left-hand side to organize it in different ways. Uh, source descending, source ascending. On the right-hand side is that blank white space. This is where you will format your paper. It's a completely dynamic area. Once that's complete, and you, add, you could add new bullets, delete any that you would like, enter your thesis or intro statement. Go up top here to print, next, and here will be your fully formatted outline with all of your note cards that you can copy and paste on top of your already exported citations in Microsoft Word or Google Docs. Be able to print out and hand in that outline or write your draft from there. And finally, well, I'm, again, this, uh, once you play around with this for five minutes, it's, it's really easy to do. And, and I'd be able to set all of you up as school administrators for your school. So you'd see all of your registered users, be able to send them their passwords if they forget, and then customize it for your school that we went over in the beginning. So your logo, and then links to all of your resources, and control your system settings. So if you don't subscribe to Turnitin, you can take off that link. You can include a link to Sweet Search. I, and change your default style. So there's a lot of things that you can do here, which also include looking up statistics for your schools, how many projects, how many citations, how many note cards have been created. Uh, and again, I know Emily touched upon this. Members of Library Link NJ do receive a 15% discount on EasyBib, as well as Research Ready. I do want to let you know that we are updating Research Ready uh, to Research Ready 2.0, and that will be introduced in the fall of this year. And due to that, we are offering 50% off of Research Ready if you subscribe between now and the end of July. And then you'll automatically be upgraded to the new version in the fall when it's available, and we won't be charging you any extra. So if you're interested to take advantage of the 50% off of Research Ready, uh, definitely get in contact with me, and we can set up a similar uh, webinar demo and trial for you. Awesome. So I'm going to pass this back to <laughs> Emily. Thanks a lot, everybody. Cool. Thanks, Brad. Um, and thank you again to everyone who took the time uh, to meet with us today. Um, if you do have any questions either about um, EasyBib, Research Ready, the discounts that are provided uh, to Library Link NJ members, or even about the presentation, um, feel free to ask these questions now. Uh, we will hang on the line for a few more minutes, um, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Additionally, I did drop Brad's email address uh, in there. It's brad at imagineasy.com. Um, so if you ever have, see if you have questions about EasyBib or Research Ready, feel free to uh, contact him anytime. Cool. I see a lot of um, thank yous, and thank you for, uh, for joining us. Again, any questions or comments, feel free to add them here. We will be sending out an email um, with the recording as well as the presentation slides and a bibliography of the resources that were discussed during the presentation today. Um, so just check your inbox in the next day or two for those resources as well. Thanks again, everyone. Um, Brad and I will stick around for another minute or so to take any final questions. <laughs>